So welcome everyone. I think we're going to get started. Um, how are people feeling? Are you, are you woken up a bit? This is hard toward the end of the evening and for me I've had a lot of information as well so I know where you're at. So I'm going to talk about an unarmed civilian protection and protective accompaniment. I'm Catherine Hughes Freytech. Um, I just started with ICNC actually two weeks ago. So for me this is an amazing um, possibility and experience to get to know all of you uh, and to be involved with this program. Um, and I'm going to talk some and talk to you about this kind of a niche piece of nonviolent um, action. But toward the end, hopefully we're going to have enough time to do a, a little bit of breakout um, sessions and have you all work on some of this as well so you can get a sense of how it works directly. Okay? As I go along, um, we're going to be moving through pretty quickly, but if you have questions as we're going, go ahead and raise your hands and I'll kind of move on quickly and let you know if it's not going to work. Okay? Okay, so as we're sitting in the room, um, thousands of civil society activists, organizations, and communities around the world are working for justice, peace, and human rights utilizing nonviolent action. They are facing serious threats, violent repression, and discrimination to hamper or halt their work. And I know many of you have people back home and you're thinking about uh, and involved with this. Okay. To counter this, many of these activists are working together in networks, seeking mutual protection mechanisms, and developing collective strategies. One of these strategies is a unique kind of support utilizing internationals, offering unarmed civilian protection and protective accompaniment. They bring hope, support, and solidarity for the movement, and a decrease in fear. And this is a picture uh, we've seen earlier, and this was something that's great with Althea because um, Peace Brigades has a team there and has worked a lot in Indonesia, um, in Aceh, in East Timor initially, and then moved to Papua, West Papua. So this is a picture of an accompanier um, with an indigenous leader from Wamana, which is a very isolated area in Papua, who had to come into the main part of Indonesia where there's also a lot of racism and go to trial. And so he's being accompanied. So we first want to look at the overarching idea of unarmed civilian protection, and I want to um, Nonviolence Peace Force, which is one of the groups that started in early 2000 and has a very big presence around the world right now. Um, they look at this uh, as a wheel of unarmed civilian protection. I think this is really useful. So if you can look at this, uh, this is the wheel. Uh, in the middle of the spokes, it's to prevent violence, increase safety and security, strengthen local peace infrastructures. So it's both reactive and proactive, okay? And then basically you're looking at exerting influence through encouragement and deterrence. So there's both a kind of pro and a deterrent part of that, omission, commission in a way. And then there are four basic um, themes. So we're looking at monitoring, which is ceasefire monitoring, rumor control, and early warning and early response. We're looking at capacity um, development, which obviously this is part of that, and ICNC is very involved. Training, supporting self-sustaining structures on the field and in the ground for an unarmed protective accompaniment. And then relationship building, which is really key as well. Confidence building, multi-track dialogue. And then the last piece, um, which is really an important piece, this proactive engagement, is interpositioning, protective accompaniment, and protective presence. And that's the part that I'm going to hone in on today because it's a very broad field and you can go into it for probably days. First, let me ask um, each of you, how many have heard of protective accompaniment or an armed civilian? Okay, all over, yeah. Hardy, yeah. Okay, so quite a few of you. Uh, and some of you have involved. Gaya actually works for Nonviolence Peace Force and is involved with them um, in some of her capacities. So, and I know Jeffrey has met with some accompaniers in Kenya we've talked about a bit. Um, so some of you are familiar about it and hopefully this will give you a little bit better sense of what we actually, what it does on the ground. So protective accompaniment has four main impacts. First of all is it protects. So we're talking about physical accompaniment of international volunteers or national volunteers who have a visible physical presence. But it is connected to international networks and I'll talk a little bit more about how that actually works. It offers moral support and an end to isolation. And this, I think, may be one of the most key aspects, and we've talked about how activists uh, feel so isolated in certain ways and how having nonviolent movements um, impacted and assisted by others is so important. 
and building the global movement for peace and human rights through volunteer experiences and through their actual involvement and kind of training, on-the-job training. And then it strengthens human rights mechanisms, instruments, organizations, and regimes. And this is something that is not a lot in the literature yet, but I'm going to be looking at a lot because I saw a very important impact with this. So for instance, the United Nations, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, and which works with Latin America, and EU guidelines on human rights defenders. And we've talked about those in other sessions with Althea, with Nicolo, and others. So I'm going to get into a little bit more examples of how that actually works. So the history of the protective accompaniment model, actually it first started really with the International Red Cross in the 1800s in Europe and then moving into a lot of other countries. But the modern model uh, that we look at today, the specific niche, was pioneered by Peace Brigades International and Witness for Peace in the 1980s. And this was around a lot of things that were happening. A lot of it was American imperialism, but other kinds of imperialism. And people were really getting frustrated at home using their own nonviolent movements, trying to push for change uh, and change for our policy overseas, and it wasn't working. So they started talking about what can we do to actually make a difference on the ground when our policy is doing things that we either believe are morally wrong or are really harming civilians in our name, and what can we do about that? So between 1990 and 2015, there was a recent study in Canada at the Peace Institute there that showed that there are now, during those periods, there were 50 plus organizations utilizing these methods. So it shows that it's being successful, hopefully, and that's the reason it's spreading and I'll talk about that, but also that it's quite broad now. It's happening in a lot of areas of the world. So PBI's name, which I think is great for ICNC uh, and us here, is based on the Shante Sena, which is Gandhi. Uh, they were developed actually with a close Gandhi aid, was part of the organizing committee originally. And that means peace army. So does anyone want to tell me real quickly, I'm sure people have heard of that, kind of the concept of the peace army. Probably that is the volunteers that they are mostly protecting the uh, civilian from the harms of God. that could be from the government that mm -hmm. in a case that they are doing the non-civil uh, civil, civil resistance activities, so they are somehow protected against what they do. Mm -hmm. No, exactly, Haroon. And it's, so it's the concept of peaceful um, protection and, again, a peace army, that there are war armies out there, there are military armies, and if we're going to be serious about this, again, nonviolent action is action. It's not passivity. So we needed a peace army, and that was the concept. Um, and you got exactly that piece. Uh, and for PBI, the nickname is Unarmed Bodyguards. And this came from a book by Leah Mahoney and Luis Enrique Iguran, uh, who's from Mexico. And those were two of my colleagues that I learned a lot from over the years at PBI and are still doing a lot of work around the world in this field. Um, and basically, you know, it's, it doesn't cover everything. It's not as extensive as what we'll talk about. But I think it's a great visual just to have in mind of these people that are there physically with an activist who's being threatened. They're unarmed, and they're protecting them from people that are armed. So it's a really interesting to me um, visual to have in mind. And it's a way for international activists to assist civil resistance movements and local nonviolent action. So we've talked a little bit, I think Hardy brought up and others, the right to assist that is being discussed. And it could come from governments through a governmental process, but it could also come from these parallel systems in the civil society. And this idea that as nonviolent um, activists around the world who want to be in solidarity, we can find ways to assist effectively through this kind of protective accompaniment or unarmed civilian protection. And another key part is it's been developed and honed over time. So I'm going to give you one example of Peace Brigades International in 81 or 82, one of the first teams that was out there, were working with a group in Guatemala called GAM. And this was a group of women that were based on the Argentinian model that you saw earlier. So they were kind of the second group to do this, trying to stand up for their disappeared sons and fathers and brothers uh, in Guatemala. It was very, very risky. And at the time, they had nowhere to meet. They were so afraid, and they were being really targeted initially. So Peace Brigades had just moved in, were trying to get this figured out, and actually invited them to meet at the house of PBI uh, for their meetings. So that was ongoing. A few months into that, there was a bomb in the PBI office, and the kitchen blew up. 
uh, and two volunteers were actually stabbed. And that's one of the only times the bomb didn't hit anyone. By chance, they were in the other room meeting, probably having a consensus discussion that went on for hours into the night, which it does, and not having their meal. But they could have been very badly wounded. And at that point, one of the women that was there that I talked to said, we backed up. We said, wait a minute, we've got to create some kind of firewall between us and the activists. If we don't do that, we can't keep ourselves safe, and therefore we can't act, you know, offer effective protection. So she talked about it like an umbrella. We're holding in the middle, we're keeping security in a little bit of a, a space, but then we're providing protection to those that can be under it. Um, because you don't want to offer, you don't want to move into a country and offer someone safety or protection if you can't give it to them. Uh, because that's the worst of what would happen. So for PBI, they backed off a bit, as did many other organizations that came out. out. Others talk about solidarity, so some are more in solidarity than others. There's a continuum, but a lot of the groups keep a little bit of distance and nonpartisanship, and I'll talk about that, because that's really part of the strategy to be able to stay in the country and provide protection. Can you say the year that that came out? Uh, it was GAM, Guatemala, about 82 or 83. Okay. okay, so we're going to look at the first point. There's four of them. Um, how unarmed bodyguards actually protect? You know, how does this work? So it's an international presence is able to deter violence through direct international presence and a strategic security plan. Okay? So as we go through this, and I was putting this together, I realized that a lot of what works for this tactic uh, and the strategies within it is very much the same as what we've been talking about for the nonviolent action and movement as a whole. So you'll, you'll see that. Um, so there's a cost-benefit analysis uh, and looking at the chain of command. And this has to be part of the whole plan when you initially move in or it doesn't really work. There are high-level decision makers. So picture those at the top, right? The presidents, the head of the militaries, the head of a uh, CEO of a business that's there, multinational. And those people generally are really worried about their image internationally, within the country for votes for their own populations, and with other people. A CEO obviously doesn't want to get the nickname as the butcher, you know, somewhere of Baghdad, I'm thinking, okay? Um, and so that's really important. That's a deterrent. And a direct perpetrator, which are farther down the line, directly taking orders normally, but they can also do it on themselves at times, they are paramilitary members. Gangs, member of the local police, a local military, if you have that in your country, and sometimes armed insurgencies as well. Okay? And those people, in general, are very uncertain about their superiors. Okay? So they're in the position of getting an order or not being sure, and they're really worried about trying to kill someone or attack them and what that might mean for their own future or their own reputation, and do they want to take the responsibility. Um, and then there's accompaniers can also exert moral support. And basically what this is about is a lot of the activists that I've known over the years and interviewed have said um, when we're there and they have internationals next to us, that really builds our own credibility within our own country, which is unfortunate, but that's the reality, or in their own local area. And there's a sense of we have someone with us who's willing to be standing there with us. And also, bottom line is no one likes to commit an act of violence and brutality in front of an eyewitness and especially an international eyewitness that may be able to get the word out very quickly to many people in the world. And then we've talked a lot about subtle threats and undermining credibility and reputation or criminalization, all of which are tactics that dictators, authoritarian regimes, people that repress are using more and more often. Um, so it's, again, you can go kill someone, but if you've got a deterrent structure in place, then that goes into the major news, and, and a lot of times it's easier to deal with. But if you just um, charge them for something that's not really true, and they have to deal with the legal system, or you undermine the reputation through just kind of whispering, uh, this person's not a real Muslim, or they're, uh, they're not a real whatever. So you can do that and undermine their credibility. Okay, so here's a good chart to kind of show this. And this is from Proactive Presence, which is a field strategies for civilian protection, something that Leah Mahoney has written more recently. Uh, and you can see here that they're the decision makers at the top, and the normal traditional way of dealing with the human rights pressure was through international pressure. So the UN Special Rapporteur makes a statement, you know, lay off this person, keep them safe. Or there's a judge somewhere, or an international court, or a president somewhere. Um, and that's directly to the decision makers. 
and the targeted civilians are way down with the perpetrator, right? So this model of having internationals there and dealing with all levels of the chain of command um, in a proactive presence targets the entire chain. It reveals responsibilities, who's doing what, and we're able to get it out and pinpoint that, and it strengthens international commitment because you get it out to the international press and there's a lot of internationals there that really care about the issue. Key aspects of the model. So you have to be highly visible. That's key to have that physical presence. You have to have links to all parts of the chain of command. And you have to ensure to them that this message of deterrence is really clear. Okay? So here's what we are talking about as consequences. Here's what's going to happen if you, if you go ahead with the violence. And all levels of the chain know that because sometimes if that chain's broken, maybe the perpetrator doesn't know about it or the decision maker doesn't know about it. And one or the other may uh, order the violence and go ahead with it. You have to have strong international links for leverage, and we'll talk more about this, but networks around the world to deal with the media, to deal with pressure at the various mechanisms, et cetera, and add credibility to activist reports and data. So again, you know, if you have someone on the ground and they're saying, I didn't um, murder this person, and this happened in Mexico. There was a team in Guerrero um, that Peace Brigades was accompanying, and basically three of the guys um, that were the very top leaders that were being very effective. And Mexico didn't know how to deal with them. The state charged them with murder. Um, and basically, we were able to say then, as accompaniers, we were able to document that they were in a meeting 100 miles away strategizing that was being observed by accompaniers and able to use that as evidence for the court. And then they had to drop the charges. Uh, utilize information to strategically exert pressure on decision makers and perpetrators. So again, there's a lot of knowledge involved, a lot of strategy, a lot of research to make this effective. For instance, Colombia. Colombia had a free trade agreement that was trying to get through the U.S. Congress for many years. And before that was passed, unfortunately it was, um, but in that process, that was very important to be used as a pressure point. Uh, against the Colombian government. So if something was happening with human rights defenders, you could say, well, we're going to use the members in Congress, or they would write letters um, uh, talking about what was happening, and then the Colombians would back off because they wanted this trade deal to go through. So you have to look at economic, political, social, other kinds of pressure, and know where their pressure points are. And the diverse makeup of field volunteers from several different countries. So the most effective protective accompaniment groups have volunteers from all over the world. Global South, Global North, all over Europe, Australia, US, Canada. That way, when one of the volunteers is on the ground and you have an issue, you cover all the embassies, all the ambassadors, the EU, the US, the Inter-American Commission, different Global South commissions, Africa Commission and others, and you have an ability to access and to uh, be seen and heard by them that you wouldn't otherwise. Can anyone tell me where this is? Can you take a guess? Can I keep going? No? Yes. Yeah, I was thinking maybe if the Nepali guys were here. OK, so this is a picture in Nepal. Uh, this was at the Chinese embassy right before the Olympics when the Tibetans all over the world were protesting. As you probably know, there's a huge Tibetan refugee group that are in Nepal. Uh, and basically, then they were going and trying to create media and et cetera at the Chinese embassy. And so they were being treated very harshly by the Nepal government and military who was being pressured by China to get them out of there and stop you know, having visual pictures with the media uh, and all the press. And so they, the um, protests were observed by a lot of different accompaniers and basically were able to then, the police at one point, because there was so much outcry internationally at the way the activists were being treated, they basically suggested and asked for help with training on how to deal with demonstrators less violently. And so we facilitated the ability of companies to get that training for the police and the army that was dealing, and the incidence of violence went way down. They asked for that. They asked for it. Wow. Yeah. You know, they saw in the international community how badly, and they said, it's because we don't know how to do this. And they were really serious about it. It doesn't always happen that way, but in this case, um, it worked. Yep, exactly. So basic shared values of accompaniers, as I said, they're all over the continuum. So you have Christian peacemaker teams. You have international solidarity movement. You have a lot of groups from Italy and from Europe and peace brigades and nonviolence peace force and witness for peace. 
and groups in Guatemala, Nizgua, and others. And the commitment that's the same for all of them is a commitment to nonviolence and to people that they're protecting are using nonviolent methods, to nonpartisanship, which basically means no political parties. It doesn't mean that you don't stand for something and that you're not on someone's side, and non-intervention. And people always ask me about this. How can you say it's not intervention? I mean, you're going into a country, you're you know, stopping a whole process, you're impacting. So yes, in this way, it's intervention for human rights, standing for civil resistance movements. But we're not, and most of the groups believe in not intervening in the local um, decision making, funding locals, um, and influencing their decisions. This is the whole do no harm process. Um, because if you do that, you can really shape policy different, and you might push someone to do something even more radical or something than they themselves can deal with for their family for many years. You can always leave, they can't. So how many of you have seen that happen with internationals in your countries? Have any of you seen where, yeah? Anna, do you want to give an example? Where people come in and they do something that makes it worse? Uh, I've seen it not with internationals, but normally with activists going to, say, other uh, areas of their country, for example, in Armenia, they mm -hmm. say, especially the ones from the urban areas or the capital, ah, who are yeah. perceived as more like elite and sort of, you know, mm -hmm. and they're away, they're rich, they can hire uh, lawyers, whatever. So if we go and do direct action with the locals, sometimes there is this thing if the locals are actually pushed into the action, then there's this frustration. Oh, you came, you put us into the, this danger, you're going to leave, we're going to have to deal with this, either company or police. That's a great point. So it can happen with internationals, or it can happen with elites in national areas that go into rural areas. It's a really good point. It, it, they really can say that this, the really the foreigners, internationals are coming and Very much supporting so. them, and that's direct intervention mm -hmm. and stuff like that, so that they can no. make Haroon, that's a, a drama out of them. Very important point, and that's why these groups have found that it's so important to be nonpartisan and to be non-intervention, um, because otherwise the government's going to try to do it anyway, and they do. But if you keep a very strong position and you're credible for long terms, it's harder to use that. It's not impossible still. Uh, locally driven with respect for local leadership, but as I said, most of these groups never go to a place unless they're invited in and talk and, and analyze with the locals before they work on these things. Um, emphasis on international humanitarian and human rights law frame and that do no harm idea that I mentioned earlier. Um, again, utilizing analysis and knowledge of nonviolent action strategies, tactics, and tools. So a lot of our work um, as protective accompaniers, people working in that field, was to study the nonviolent tactics, was to study Gandhi and Martin Luther King and these actions, uh, because a lot of it's very relevant. So field officer strategic planning and management, um, just very quickly, just to show you. So again, I think it's the same in the general broad field. Information gathering, then doing analysis, then doing strategy, and then the circle keeps going, and it always has to be updated. So our field volunteers in PBI, but also all of the rest of the field volunteers that I've talked to in these groups, say a lot of their time is not even traveling or being with people, it's doing information gathering, analysis, keeping up on local papers, local information. Tactics and leverage, um, real quickly. So here is a, a tactical level, and I think we've talked about this in other sessions too. Um, and again, from Liam Mahoney's um, book, but it's just that each level that you have to go up, you want all these different options. You don't want to go crazy and make a whole bunch of press and publicity if a little bit of something will do it in the beginning. So again, if someone does something locally, if you can persuade them, um, use issues to deter the violence, use it. If you have to go to the next level, and more incentives, maybe at the local or state level, then the national level, and then you get to the international level, Again, each of these quietly first, and then the very last level is using all of your networks, yelling as loud as you can, getting as much publicity for something really serious that happens. The key piece with all of this is if you show there'll be a cost or benefit and a consequence, and you're talking about it um, as a group, and something serious happens, and that doesn't happen, the consequence doesn't get in place, nothing happens, the whole thing is shot. And the whole thing can be shot for your organization all around the world because the word travels between governments and for other groups that use this method. So it's really, really important. In Honduras, um, there were some incidents with people that were already in doing protective accompaniment. They had two or three people kidnapped. This was a, a, just about a year ago. There were other teams that were moving in. 
and immediately those groups got together in coalition, used all of their resources to get the people back safely and quickly, um, to show that there was a deterrence, that the government couldn't go ahead and kidnap internationals because it would have sunk their program as well, trying to get in there. So that, that's a really key thing to keep in mind. International Network in Action, I'm going to hurry. So this is um, in response to one serious attack. This was in Uraba, the peace community, San Jose del Partido, which I've gotten to travel to a lot, amazing group. But they went in, um, the paramilitaries, and they literally cut off the heads of about four of the main leaders. There was a big massacre uh, that occurred from this community, from the leaders. And they are saying, we're a peace community. Paramilitary can't come in. The FARC can't come in or the military. We want our space for peace. And because of that, they've been targeted by all the different groups, not just one. Okay? So this is what happened. There was a letter of concern to President Uribe, signed by 60 members of the US Congress. There was a delegation that went there from Britain, Spain, Canada, Dutch, and the UN. There were press releases all over, articles in all the national newspapers, special meeting between the vice president, who's now president, and diplomatic groups, public communiques, public expression of concern by the Inter-American Commission, Motion of support by the Australian Senate, public statements of support. So all of that happened, let me just go back, all of that happened within just a period of less than a month. So you can bet the government was just, you know, taken aback, the deterrence really worked, they really had issues within the international community, there were a lot of things that happened um, and a lot of um, shame that occurred, a lot of lowering of their reputations at various levels, um, risk of prosecution, et cetera, and they really backed off. Um, and the peace community to this day says if that wouldn't have happened at that key time, they were planning to go into one by one by one of the villages that had spread out over the last 10 years to reclaim their land that the paramilitaries had taken over in the 60s and 70s and they were gonna wipe all of us out. That was their plan. So that stopped. It didn't stop all the violence. They lost the leaders, but it did stop a massacre of the whole community. Okay, this is a team in Medellin, uh, Colombia. Um, and this was a quote, again, I'm using, as you obviously can see, quite a bit from PBI because that's my personal experience and also trying to be a bit broader, but it's, very, it's the very same for a lot of the accompaniment groups. So the most valuable thing about PBI is I feel I'm no longer alone. And what I'm doing must be valuable if people from around the world risk their lives to walk with me. And that's a real sense. You know, they know if you're in the field, I'm sure you all know you're doing valuable work, but sometimes just having someone else recognize it or go the extra mile to be there with you can make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And this woman, Liliana Uribe, who looks very sweet in the blue, she is one of the toughest women I've ever met. She has been threatened by gangs, by paramilitary, she's been kidnapped, I mean, all across the board, um, because she's working on a national case against enforced disappearances all across Colombia into a pattern that would create war crimes, um, which would be huge, and trying to stop that. Okay, so how, how and their bodyguards offer more support? Um, as we've talked about, regimes use targeted violence to create fear and isolation, as you all know. So accompaniers break through the isolation, they increase the visibility of the work, and this leads, which is the key piece, to this increased political space and increased participation by others in the movement. People aren't as afraid if the leaders can keep going or a small group. So in the end, this allows them to create a successful nonviolent resistance movement. I mean, it's exactly what we've been talking about. If people are targeted, if they're afraid, if they have to back up, if they go into exile, they can't work, and then no one, everyone else is afraid to join them. So this is the concept, is creating the safe space for peace through internationals and not getting directly involved to let people do their work. Okay. How do they build the international human rights movement? So this is key too. This is the capacity area. And this, you all come into this really very much with FSI. Thousands of trained accompaniers worldwide since the early 80s. It's been more than about 35 years. They've all gained personal experiences and stories that they tell all the time. They're well versed in human rights. And they're also very motivated because they've stood next to human rights defenders and activists like you all. And they've learned about the courage and they've learned how important it is, and they've learned the costs and how people keep going. They understand firsthand the power of nonviolent action, so they become proponents for our movements. 
And the key piece is they're a bridge. So they're a bridge between the locals, maybe rural areas, because a lot of them try to go more that way than right in the urban areas where there's so much attention, and the global community. So there's a lot of newsletters, there's travel, there's speaking tours, those kind of things. And their own local communities, whether it be in Europe or other places in the global south or in the US. And so they can bridge that gap as well. And the, the really interesting thing is this isn't just an offshoot. This is a key objective and goal of the unarmed civilian protection movement is to create this workforce of people and to create this dedicated specialist that can do this work and can be part of this human rights movement. So that's really exciting. And you're one of those too. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> Welcome, Adagio. Uh, how unarmed bodyguards strengthen human rights regimes, mechanisms, organizations. This is, I said, something that I'm going to really be looking at more and more because I saw it working so well, and I haven't seen a lot about writing about it yet. This is Margaret Sakagia. This was an event we had with her in Washington, DC, and then at the UN. Uh, she was a special rapporteur on human rights defenders, the, the previous one, and she was very active. Um, so what happens is there's this long-term, uh, in-depth documentation, knowledge, um, connection to rural groups that otherwise aren't seen that occurs, okay? And coalitions are built through this networking. So you've got all of these groups working together and have been connected that otherwise wouldn't be there. And then what happens is those groups and can push initiatives, push different things at the higher levels that are much broader and, and wider and affect many more people than the local direct physical uh, tension and accompaniment. So for instance, at any one time I'll show you, there you know, could be uh, 15 countries around the world that have this protective accompaniment. But its reach is much bigger when, for example, EU guidelines on human rights defenders, those were utilized and developed, we talked about with Nicola, in the early 2000s. Uh, all of the company or organizations, including Peace Brigades, Witness for Peace, probably Nonviolence, Peace Force, and others, were engaged in helping write those and engaged in getting the defenders who they worked with to give them information on where were the gaps, what would best help them, what would be the most useful way um, to protect them. So that information went into this document. And then 10 years later, they did a whole nother update, which was just a couple of years ago, and those same groups were there to say, this hasn't worked, this has worked, but this hasn't worked. You're not reinforcing it, or we need to add something new about criminalization because it's a new technique by governments. And so that connection was really key, and it protects activists all over the world, not just in these specific countries. Um, one more example, I'm going to go fairly quickly. Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. You heard about that earlier um, with Althea's. Um, no, it was with Myra's case um, with the Belamonte Dam. So there, we got together all of, a lot of accompaniers from all over Latin America, both accompaniers from Latin America and internationals, human rights groups like Amnesty and others, and we did a huge thematic case on all of the issues in Latin America on human rights defenders and their risks. And we presented it, and they had, we had 25 groups and a whole bunch of witnesses, but we had another 200 pages of documentation that backed it up about all of the issues. One of those asks, at that hearing was we would like, and especially the, the people that are the defenders, would like a human rights defender special rapporteur that looks like the UN. And we don't have that yet. Within one month, it was so well documented and the case was well presented that they created a special rapporteur for human rights defenders. He was very active. He went out to the field. He connected with the human rights activists in the rural areas that had never had access to him. And he trained the protective accompaniment teams in that area on the laws and how to access them, which was really helpful for the activists. So those benefiting from UCP and PA. Um, so let me see a, a raise of hands in the room. Who considers themselves a human rights defender? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a number. So you all almost fit in there. Lawyers, who, can, who's are, who are lawyers, human rights lawyers in the room? Okay, the lawyers have left. <laughs> uh, Yes, sure, Anna. Uh, nature, nature's defender would not fall under human rights, but it's a, sort of a net defender. And yeah. I feel uncomfortable putting that under human rights. Okay, okay. So I think under, 
I think it was Nicola that read the definition of the human rights defender in 1998, and it's so broad that it could fit in there, but I would put it under environmental activists or defenders. That's okay because I hadn't gotten there, because they are a very specific group that is happening more and more, being attacked more and more. So I would also, you know, we could put them there. Um, indigenous populations, so that's really important. Uh, and again, these people are working for all of us as we're talking to save Mother Earth, to protect the environment, um, and they're really in the trenches in a number of places. Labor organizations, peasant organizations, so campesinos reclaiming their land, environmental activists, and then again, communities and whole movements. Um, so for instance, Nonviolence Peace Force um, is working with huge communities in South Sudan, huge areas and, and groups of people, um, and different tribes and, and different issues of facilitation there and had major conflict, and they're working in some refugee camps and protecting whole refugee camps areas. Um, with peace brigades, they're doing that in Colombia, some of the peace communities, but people all over the world, this is groups. Are we ready to coming? There you go. Oh, that's it. Are you not there? Yeah. Did you find another one? Yeah. I feel like my sector is left out. Uh, is it that it was never considered to benefit under UNCPA? What is your sector? Um, from the security forces. That's a really good we question. We do protect when it comes to humanitarian issues and so mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. what, what I would say there is I think there would be an assumption that because you're a security force that at least you would have power to somewhat protect yourself, mm -hmm. but also in this loop that we would want, these groups would want to work closely with you um, to ensure that there's a connection and a communication mm -hmm. and that you're aware of all this so that you could even do a more effective job um, protecting others in your country that are, uh, that are doing civil rights movements and civil resistance. Yeah, because Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense because that's the gap that I'm seeing in mm -hmm. most of the presentations. That, mm -hmm. uh, as much as they are giving this nice knowledge and everything, it's like they are leaving the, the security sectors too much out. Mm -hmm. And that gap should be mm -hmm. closed or be narrowed to a certain extent, either by developing a communication, giving them capacity, the knowledge. Mm -hmm. or no, that's a great point. And again, I think it's very similar to Nepal, where they literally came and asked for, we don't really know what we're doing. We don't want to do more violence than we need to. Could you help train us on some crowd control methods that are nonviolent? Because maybe to add to, Party? to that Others? one also, Namibia, yeah. just to add to that one. Sure. Namibia and some other countries that I have seen in Southern Africa, they have started this program of community policing. <coughs> this type of information can be linked to community policing because community policing is a new concept in our area and it needs a lot of skills. And you can see from the commanders, they really want to improve the relationship between the security forces and the communities. But how to do it, yeah. you need some other sectors. That's a very good point. Hardy? You mentioned security sector, and it got me thinking also how um, there are within the security sector, we know this obviously, there are double thinkers or biconceptuals, uh, people who will uh, obey orders under certain circumstances uh -huh. but not other circumstances. Uh -huh. And some of that might have to do with where their personal loyalties or, or sympathies lie, and some of that might have to do with how much they feel they can <coughs> sort of get away with not obeying orders or obeying orders inefficiently. And I'm thinking about how the presence of unarmed civilian protectors or protective companies changes the dynamic within security forces so that moderates mm. or biconceptuals have a different set of arguments they can make about why they can't do repression. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult mm -hmm. to do research on this issue because mm -hmm. in general security forces don't talk about their internal processes. You yep. have to rely on leaked documents. However, there are cases where we certainly where we actually have gotten access and into much more sort of in-depth testimony about what people were thinking about. Yes. And so it's yeah. interesting to think about this role actually being beneficial to moderates within those mm -hmm. institutions because mm -hmm. it provides them, in a sense, political cover to and, and support for their arguments that we mm -hmm. should try a different way. Mm -hmm. so. I think it's a great point. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yes. Oh, I think you first and then Gay. Yeah. yeah. And a program we have been, you know, implementing in Burkina Faso. Yeah. Uh, a program from Amnesty International dealing with, you know, training trainers of trainers from your national police. It was very difficult, but mm -hmm. I can tell you that in certain way it, you know, was benefit. It, it really benefited to, you know, policemen and policewomen who now have a very different perception of uh, human rights activists. 
because they used to be treated like you know the one who are the most greatest violators, but yeah. now things have started to change. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that uh, the recent event, uh, policemen were the one security force who really respect in certain extent human rights of the you know demonstrator. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important to work with them mm -hmm. and uh, you know have some kind of communication. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yep. Okay, and I just wanted to say, in, uh, following up on what Hardy said, that Nonviolent Peace Force recently had an instance, and it's on their website, of two, in South Sudan, two yeah. non-Sudanese unarmed civilian protectors. And by the way, sometimes this is done with mixed groups of nationals and internationals, but in that yeah. case, it was non-Sudanese, who were in a hut protecting a dozen <clears throat> women and children, and security forces came by and yeah. wanted to kill the people several times over the course of, I think, two days, and they told the unarmed civilian peacekeepers, you leave now. And they refused to leave, and they didn't have protection themselves, but somehow they de-escalated and talked it down so that the security forces left and the people survived. Now, in a way, that is also helping the security forces, not only in training, right. but I don't know if they went off and killed people elsewhere, but the taboo to kill, I think, is quite strong. Mm -hmm. And once you break it, something mm -hmm. in you breaks, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. And so at least these people were saved of that that time mm -hmm. and helped. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Well, There's my one. experiences in Sri Lanka are quite significant with the security forces, particularly on my team, because of course we're deployed in teams. Mm -hmm. And then I was, uh, I mean, the Navy in Trinko Mali where they had issues relating to livelihoods. Fishermen were not allowed to go out <coughs> from five, and the Navy knew, and it was a problem. But the Navy needed to win the trust of the, uh, that's in, actually, it's, a, it's also an acknowledgement of the recognition they have for unarmed civilian peacekeepers, because we had significant acceptance. Of course, we had the odd incident here and there. The Navy would approach us, and they would actually respect the non-violent stance we take, and they would, they would tell us they would drop their weapons. I mean, this was in the midst of the war, at great risks to themselves, mm -hmm. you know, knowing that rebel forces would probably track them to. But even just sending the message out, because I remember the Trinco town commander used to tell us that, well, if they want to kill him, I mean, he kept down his weapon, and where he's, uh, he actually even felt protected by our presence. Mm -hmm. So he would come to our office, and then, we do stakeholder mapping, look for significant fishermen who are afraid of them. Uh, and then they, they'd have an interface and they, they, would, they, would not, they would explain their position. That listen, this, this, these are the reasons. And then the people would be able to dialogue with the Navy and find some compromises to mm -hmm. fishing at odd times and things like that. So mm -hmm. with the security forces, it's just the non-violent stance, really, that, that uh, mm -hmm. A few of them have been known to respect that about us. And we worked significantly with the police in Trinco as well, organizing what they call peace committees. Mm -hmm. So that there's a, there's a dyna dynamic there, but uh, it's the mm -hmm. violence and mm -hmm. non-violence aspect that is, uh, that is the issue. Thank you. Thanks. It's great, great examples. OK. So research on this, again, part of this is um, it's very difficult to do quantitative research. Um, so again, you can't have a normal case study where you have uh, one that you're going to protect and one exactly like it next door that you're not going to protect and then you can see who gets killed more often, right? bottom line, right? Um, we do have examples, so qualitatively, um, there are a lot of examples. Number one is you act, ask the activists, how has this impacted you? How has it impacted your work? And you hear again and again, I wouldn't be alive without it. Uh, morally, it's helped me so much um, and stay out of isolation. My emotional situation is much better. I, that's something you hear time and time again uh, in responses. And also, I'm able to stay here. I'm not in prison. I'm not being tortured. My organization hasn't been run underground, and I'm keeping to do my work. So you hear that again and again. So I think that has to have a lot of weight. But quantitative studies are harder. Um, so there have been more and more. There's a recent study that you could check out at this Mir Center for Peace in Canada, um, Shifting Practices of Peace, What is the Current State of Unarmed Civilian Peacekeeping? And it's an interesting article that's very recent and talks about some of the, the feedback and information that's ongoing. And it has the information about these 50 civil society organizations um, since 1990. 
Uh, there's an external evaluation of unarmed civilian protection and nonviolent peace force work in Mindanao in the Philippines. Um, and again, you can read that. Um, so temper their behavior, but that definitely you know, is probably deterring violence. Um, PBI and others have a lot of external, um, also Fellowship of Reconciliation, I should mention, is very effective and very active. Um, and we all have had external reviews um, that looked at some of these issues and, and tried to show, again, certain areas where it was based, there was less violence from the prior time. But it was very hard to do that um, and to have the quantitative studies to back it up. But I think it's very clear that it's working um, based on the activists, based on when some of these programs try to move out and there's a huge outcry um, and almost a panic of, you know, how are we, will we continue to do our work? Um, Peace Brigades did move out of Guerrero, for example, was still monitoring it, um, but feeling like it was stabilizing a bit and based on what the activists were saying, there was more need in the north of Mexico. So they moved their teams there. Um, within the two years, uh, you saw what happened to Guerrero with the student killings. Uh, so there was still a lot of things going on and the groups that are trying those cases and trying to move it forward, Palachi Nolan, a human rights lawyers group, was always accompanied as now being accompanied again because now they're under a lot of direct threat. Um, and then um, this is internal. So some of the things that were talked about at lunch, um, reductions in shootings by 41% and killings by 73%, a Northwestern study of a group cure violence work in the inner city. So that's showing, you know, in the U.S. it works as well domestically. Um, here's where environments where it's most effective. I just want to go over this real quickly and then we're going to do a little exercise. So you've heard a lot about how nonviolent techniques and actions and strategies and tactics really aren't based on conditions in countries, that they'll work pretty much anywhere if you've got a good plan, okay? Um, with this specific tool or tactic in uh, nonviolent action, it is important where you use it. And there are certain areas it doesn't work and that it works better than others, okay? Uh, and those are still being developed. But basically, preventative and early stage ex escalation of violence, it does work. It helps to de-escalate, as Gay mentioned. So I've got an example of Kenya. Kenya keeps kind of going up and down with the violence levels. Um, during post-conflict transitions, that's one of the places we've seen it be the most effective. So Nepal, Guatemala, Colombia is not post-conflict, but hopefully they're getting there. Um, Mexico, um, Indonesia, but not in the middle of a war. So there are, there are various places that work, Sri Lanka. Um, also, there's got to be clear territorial authority and control. So for instance, in Afghanistan, uh, in Iraq at certain periods, uh, in um, the Democratic Republic of Congo, all of those places, teams have tried to go in. And because you don't have this thing with the top decision maker down to the perpetrator, and there's not the chain of command, because they are not in control of their own territory, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work well. And sometimes teams have had to pull out because they've been threatened with violence and clearly the deterrence factor was not working. Yeah, sure. So there's got to be a clear territorial authority and control. So you as a leader, whatever that leader is or looks like, has to be in control of your own area and your own land. And you have to be able to control those people and stop the people if you order it to deter the violence. If you're not in control, Kabila, for instance, in the Democratic Republic of Congo was the area they moved into where there are a lot of rapes and killings. But in his case, he would love to make the president of the Congo look bad. He would love to kill internationals. I mean, I'm not, you know, I can't say that for him, but theoretically, they wouldn't have to worry as much because they weren't going to deal with the repercussions. Um, they, they were maybe happy to have some violence involved and to, make, to undermine the authority. Same with drug gangs in Mexico. That's been a really big problem. Guatemala more and more. Um, if, for instance, and again, this is where the analysis came in, where peace brigades moved in Mexico was where they knew directly based on research that the drug gangs were working with the federal government or the state government in those regions. So you could show direct connection and you could then have deterrence through that and consequences. But if you were working in a region where the drug gangs were, the cartels were against the state government in those regions, which was the case, then again, they may be very happy to make that state government or that national government look bad. So then the deterrence method is gone. Um, and I would have to mention Israel-Palestine. Uh, that fits in the middle somewhere. And I've got it in occupied countries. Um, working with international solidarity movement, 
as you all probably know, um, in 2003, right when the Iraq War started, um, the movement was really growing since 2000. Lots of people were moving in as internationals. Um, we're doing a lot of protection work um, and raising a lot of knowledge in the outside world about what was happening. Uh, and people believe that Israel may have waited for a very important strat strategic time to then kill three or four of these international activists. Um, Rachel was run over with a tank. Tom Herndell was sharpshooted when he was protecting a child. Um, John Miller was killed as a British photographer or as a reporter. Um, and then you have Brian Avery who was shot through the face in the West Bank. So within a very short time, because again, they called the bluff, there weren't any serious consequences that happened at that point uh, from the international community. And therefore, the whole deterrence model kind of collapsed initially. People were afraid to go. Internationals didn't want to go and get killed. Uh, the Palestinians and other Israeli, maybe peace activists, didn't feel protected. And so they had to rework the model over time. It's starting to build up again, and people like Iyad, who you know, ICNC just gave the award to are people that are helping develop the model again um, with the internationals that he's working with. And so again, it can work in areas of occupied countries. There are the most teams in Israel, Palestine, of anywhere in the world over this last period, but it's also, it's very tricky. Um, can complement the work of UN missions. South Sudan is a good example. And um, to deter violence connected to traditional state actors, which is again the authority. That's the easiest place. Again, we're looking at corporations now, at drug cartels, at other groups. It's, a, it's trickier. It's harder to find the chain of command. It's harder to find the cost benefit and the pressure points, but it's not impossible. So that work's going on. Okay, we're talking about Palestine. There's one of the tanks um, that people are dealing with, um, one of the protests. Um, this is Christian Peacemakers team and the International Solidarity Movement are in both those places. Um, in regions where UCP and PA have been utilized since 1990, I just wanted to show you really quickly. This is from that study. So North and South America, you can see it's very targeted to certain areas. Um, El Salvador had a lot. Colombia's had a ton. Guatemala, those are the major ones. But also Mexico, Canada, U.S. Canada and the U.S., it's mainly been with indigenous populations. Europe and Middle East, again, you can see it's kind of spread out. Israel, Palestine, huge. Iraq, some. Um, in Iraq, it's normally been the Kurdish areas, although there have been some other areas, but again, it's depended on whether authority was in place, and usually it also doesn't work, I should have mentioned, in direct war, in the middle of a war. That should have been a point up there. Uh, and then Asia and Africa. So we've had Nepal, Sri Lanka, Philippines, East Timor, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, Kenya, et cetera. Okay, just gives you a sense. Okay. This is a women's movement uh, in Guatemala that's a minority of the, it's, they're not a Mayan group, um, but they're an indigenous group, um, and they were way out in the rural areas, but they were being targeted by the corporations, by their local government, because they were asking for right to vote and, and lack of corruption, and the national government, because they were bringing up issues of corruption and militarism, uh, and they were just these amazingly um, co courageous women. So challenges, let me finish up and then we're going to do a quick exercise from you all. And if you, so official registration and legal status in country, that's always a challenge. How do you get in? How do you stay in? Okay. Pressure from the host country, not to talk about too much, to have certain guidelines. Um, when, you know, there's certain things you want to do, they kind of threaten and negotiate with you um, around it. And let me just quickly tell a story with um, Peace Brigades. Um, talking about this window, they had, when Chiapas hit, a lot of requests came in from the group in Chiapas. Peace Brigade saw that. There were a lot of internationals that went and said, well, you know, maybe we should look somewhere else. So they looked at Guerrero to start with, um, which was an area a lot of violence, uh, indigenous groups, but not a lot of people were there. In fact, no internationals at the time. But the government wouldn't let them in. So what happened was when the Fox uh, group um, was, was elected the first time in years and years, decades, in Mexico, a change of government, the old government that was sitting there said, oh, welcome now. Come in, come in. Come as fast as you can and let Peace Brigades in right before Fox started their administration. Um, and then the Fox government was in place. They were saying international, oh, we're going to be great at international human rights. They were on the Human Rights Council as a leader. And they then were in a position, they couldn't push the group out. 
So they were stuck with peace brigades and other groups. And so there's really key strategic planning and windows of opportunity that you've got to work with um, to get there. Okay, um, nonviolent activists. We've, I think we've talked about this here. What if you're accompanying a group that is doing nonviolent things but breaking a lot of laws, direct action? But you're there legally in the country, so what do you do about that? And there are, again, various strategies, but that's a tricky one. Um, establishing effectiveness and deterrence with rogue non-state actors, and I talked about that. Um, the increased criminalization of HRDs, that's a tricky one because you know, you're accompanying them, but they've been charged with theft or murder or whatever. And basically what you a lot of times have to do is get them connected to lawyers, um, help them connect to funds because you're not normally as a group giving funds. Um, that's part of what you say a little bit of back. Um, you can publicize this to the outside world if it's incorrect, but literally there are people sitting in prison, possibly being tortured in other places that have been accompanied that it's very difficult to get them out. One of the things at PBI is we started creating lawyers committees of human rights in various countries providing pro bono assistance for this very situation so that um, activists could access that. Pros and cons of the Global North versus Global South volunteers, and Gay brought that up. Um, part of the, the issue is sometimes the deterrence issue is really hard. If you're a local in your own country that's very impressive and you're alone um, on a team, sometimes you're more open to attack at that point. Um, and if you have internationals there because of the broad base and the impact of that, sometimes that's safer. However, it's also really important for people within a country, maybe in another region, that may have a lot better connections, a lot more wisdom in that country, um, and again, you know, really more dedication and trying to lead the way. So that's what other groups have tried to do, and I think there's pros and cons of it. Um, developing effective rapid response teams, how do you do that? Yemen, Syria, Bahrain. Uh, there was a group with ISM that tried to get in Bahrain and do this. The first day they got in, they were in a march, we're internationals, we're protecting. The secret police came, took them, cuffed them. This is Hueda and Adam and others. Uh, cuffed them, shipped them out the next day. They're deported, they have no impact. And that's because all of this is based on a lot of strategic planning, a lot of relationship building, getting in there legally over time, having status, and it's really hard to do with rapid response. Um, how to grow the field to increased impact, because it's really important it does work. So that would be the question for all of us um, and our nonviolent movements, how do we grow it? Uh, how to gain credibility as a replacement to militarized power. So the issue that Erica just talked about. Everyone hates people that talk about nonviolence. You know, uh, if we have an armed force, even if it's a UN <laughs> peacekeeping force, but they have arms, they like that and they see that it works. But even if you can show this works, it's hard to have the credibility. So in closing, um, I believe that the field of unarmed civilian protection and protective accompanying has proven its value over the years and its effectiveness to deter violence and protect civilians in conflict regions. And as we move forward, I think we need to ask ourselves how we can expand this powerful tool to assist people. Um, so outsiders to assist your work in, in country, but you all to also assist others so that we can use this for the legal system, how we have access that, resources, institutional changes, training, education, and research. So again, how do we do this? And it's just one more part of the bigger puzzle of how do we, yes, Matt. Sure. Sure. Do you ever struggle with the issue of dependence and kind of long protracted struggles? I mean, you have a struggle yeah. that's going on for a number of years, yeah. something might happen, uh, and then you pull out and all the dynamics very quickly change. It's a, it's a great question, and it does happen. Um, the, the question always becomes how much is um, kind of emotional dependence and how much is actual physical dependence that if the accompaniers leave, literally these people are going to be attacked. And it's really hard to always um, balance that and figure that out. Um, but there's a lot of discussions, you know, for instance, with the accompaniers, I think most of them say we'd love to work ourselves out of a job. We'd love to go out of country. But the experiences I've seen in the countries that peace brigades and nonviolence peace forces and others, even if you're in a region that's become pretty violent in that lessons, there's another region that opens up that's even worse uh, where you need to move to. And things have tended to get worse rather than better um, in a lot of the areas that were based. Nepal was one that PBI chose to move out of. 
um, for a number of reasons and then to monitor it. But they know very clearly that once the trials start and once the 100% impunity for the conflict period is gone, the level of, of um, security issues and deterrence and violence is going to go way high and threat and someone's going to need to get back in there. And then it's harder to get back in once you've left. But there are all the issues about where do you send resources, what's the priority. Um, again, in Mexico, having moved from region to region, but once you leave a region, then a huge crime happens there again. And then there's a huge need again. So I think, it, yeah, it's, it's a good question, but it's, it was always thinking that, well, it's time to move. But then the reality showed that really the activists were very clear about the understanding that they still needed protection. And it wasn't just about a dependency factor. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I, I was thinking, uh, uh, in terms of Colombia, Mexico, there is another collective with huge problems. Journalists receiving death threats for uncovering corruption or links yes. between politicians and narco-trafficking. Yes. Do you work protecting also journalists? Yes, yes, thank yes. you. <laughs> Actually, Mabel, that, uh, that should have been on that list. Uh, journalists are a big one that are worked with, um, especially those that are working with um, conflict era issues, that are uncovering corruption, uh, that are working on issues with um, really important cases, human rights cases. So they are definitely one of the, the group that are protected. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. Uh -huh. Anna, and then Ramona. Uh, so uh, obviously there are these areas where you are not allowed to get in. Uh, and I can imagine this so much needed in a place like Chechnya, where there's a lot of abduction. Yes incredible fear and also local authority that actually um, implements and carries out the external authority. But um, you won't be able to get to Chechnya, I can imagine. Would this uh, sort of organizational structure be possible to be implemented by local groups? Or do you think it still makes no sense? I mean, if you know, mm -hmm. if some people get together and say, we're a, we're, we're a peace brigade and we're going to go and guard this particular place or particular mm -hmm. institution, NGO, or house, uh, do you think it would deter from the security forces um, mm -hmm. to also take them over them, or would it not? No, it's a great question. What, what I can say is many of the groups that some of these accompaniers that are international um, accompany also are accompanying groups in their own countries. So for instance, there's a very large one in Guatemala that peace brigades work with to accompany at the national level who then are accompaniers for rural areas in Guatemala. And there it works very well um, because they're very credible. They've developed relationships over time. I think part of it may have been the relationship with an international accompanier to begin with that kind of give them credibility and networks and access, but now they're quite effective and they're, they're really good at what they do and actually more effective because they know the areas better, they have more reach. So I think it's a very possible model. I think it's just really thinking through the deterrence piece um, and how with the cost benefit analysis and what would need to be in place for people maybe more at the national level to deter violence within the country and whether there are partnerships somehow necessary maybe outside the country where you'd have allies that could almost be virtual. That's what PBI did in, in Papua, in West Papua. Um, Althea mentioned basically the International Red Cross was kicked out. Peace Brigades was the only international group left at that point. And then they went after us, the PBI at the time. And so what happened there was there was all kinds of strategy. What do we do? What happens? What, you know, how are we going to deal with this? And went into a mode of being on the mainland and not getting into Papua physically, because that's where they wouldn't give visas and access. As she said, it's closed. But what happened was, over time, we realized that not being there physically made a difference. And they were starting to attack the activists. Um, and so PBI didn't believe that they could give them like a guarantee. And there's never a guarantee. but a good percentage that they wouldn't be attacked. And so decided that rather than kind of playing in this in-between land that really wasn't working, that would just pull out so that you know wasn't the facade of actually working, and then try to work with the activists more kind of virtually. But it, it definitely gave less protection uh, than it could have been physically, but more protection than zero, than no connection. So if that makes sense, there'd be a continuum. And I think it's more effective on the ground with international, but there are ways to do it otherwise. Yeah. Ramona? Yeah, I was just wondering what kind of training do mm, the volunteers undertake before mm -hmm. deployment? 
That's a great question. So um, again, I think it's the same as, as what we're talking about at FSI. The more training you have, the better, yeah. bottom line. Uh, and so the, the groups that tend to work the best have pretty intensive training. Uh, core training that goes over you know, a lot of things. What happens with a member of the groups is there's a lot of training up front and screening before the volunteers are selected. When there's a very long process of applying to be a field volunteer, then there's a very large ex selection process with quite a bit of competition. Um, so they're really good folks that, that people are getting. Then there's usually very intensive training to develop the final team, and that can be a week or two or even a month um, with people, you know, 10 hours a day. And then once the teams are selected and go in country, there's normally a long period uh, of training there, as well as having kind of um, um, on-the-job training so you follow someone for a month or two or three before you're given responsibility to watch what's happening to learn, as well as more kind of classroom training. Um, so different, different groups have different amounts. Um, there's some that are even as low as two weeks, three weeks, a month, two months. People kind of go in and out. That may be with church groups, it may be youth groups. Um, those tend to be less trained, um, maybe in less risky areas, showing more presence internationally and maybe not as direct protection. Um, but other groups tend to do a year or two stints. Mm -hmm because, again, you're doing a lot of resource investment in this person, and, again, a huge learning curve when you're in country and to learn everywhere. The language is another important aspect, and I didn't mention that. That should have been on the challenge list. Um, definitely in, in Latin America, most people that um, most groups send for longer periods are fluent in Spanish. They have to be. Uh, some of them know some indigenous language because that could be another issue. And then when you're going into areas where people don't speak as much, like Bahasa Indonesia, Nepali, et cetera, that's tricky. And so you need translators. You need some people that can speak the language. Um, that's where having Global South and Indian that goes into Nepal is really effective um, because they're from another country, but they speak a close language. So you know those are always French you can do in a lot of Africa countries. Um, and, and a lot of countries do have English, like Kenya. So most of the teams in Kenya don't speak Swahili that we've seen, but that's a really good thing to have. And on top of it, you are then dealing with more of the groups that are more elite, that, that, that have the language of English that you can communicate with. So those are all challenges. Yeah. Yes, Adele? Yeah, the training, I think it's, uh, it's more of a, it's very cognitive, actually, the pre-deployment trainings. Like Non-violent peace force, like you said, everything she said was correct. In India, you go to India, but you need to believe in third, part, third party non-violent intervention, TPNI. It's not just knowing it and understanding it, it's actually trusting that it works. It's true. Because once there's a third party introduced into any conflict dynamics, it alters the dynamics. I mean, that we know. But then the creativity is in what you do with the alteration, how it alters, and your alertness to that. But yeah, there's significant training. Team building, language training, and the core training, and then of course, series of in-country trainings. And then deployment, I was up. My deployment was almost three years in mm -hmm. Sri Lanka, yeah. It was Yeah, it's long term. Wow. Okay. I just wanted to mention that because of time, you focused on uh, protection. But if people will remember yes, the, the wheel, wheel. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other things that unarmed civilian protectors do, uh, and probably de-escalation and localized violence prevention is one of the main things. And then, as Adeja was saying, like direct capacity building of local people in, with conflict resolution skills, so that when you leave, they can yeah. continue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think, actually, it's a really, a really interesting exercise. Um, are we done at 5.30? I have a feeling it's about time. Oh, we do. Okay. So actually, okay. So what I'd like to do, can you all move quickly? Yes. Can you do it quickly? Okay. So I'd like maybe this side of the room to get together and this side of the room to get together. So just move, you know, close so we can use our time well. Oh, good. Okay. So this is what I want.